I know we like to spend a lot of our time talking about the overlay in an SDA fabric, but we do need to consider what's happening underneath that overlay, in other words, in the underlay. In this video, we're going to explore all of the considerations we need to make when designing out that network. Let's dive in. We love to draw our SDA fabrics like this, where we're connecting all of our edge devices via these VXLAN tunnels and life looks good. But when doing a design, we absolutely have to take into account the fact that we have devices that are facilitating these fabric communications. This is the underlay, and in most cases, these are going to be layer 3 switches that are forming a layer 3 environment that allows us to build those VXLine tunnels. So these underlay devices are typically going to be configured in some kind of topology. It doesn't really matter. It's why it's an underlay. We're going to build that overlay regardless of what the underlying topology looks like. So what do we need to consider? Well, first of all, this underlay can be layer 2 or layer 3. However, Cisco highly recommends layer 3, and that usually is best practice. Because one of the purposes of going with software defined access is to get away from layer 2 communications, such that we have to rely on spanning tree and spreading VLANs everywhere. If we build our underlay at layer 2, then spanning tree is going to be a big part of managing that underlay, and that is not a desirable position to be in. Now, for running at layer 3, we need a routing protocol, and Cisco recommends ISIS. If we use LAN automation from DNA Center to deploy the underlay for us, then it's going to deploy ISIS. However, if we're doing it manually, then this is where we can choose our routing protocol. And even though ISIS is recommended, Cisco will support EIGRP, go figure, it's their protocol, and they'll also support OSPF. Now, as part of this routing protocol, we need to make sure that we're advertising the loopback interfaces of the edge devices into the underlay. In other words, when we make our underlay connections, we're going to have layer 3 interfaces on these edge devices that connect to layer 3 interfaces on the underlay devices. We'll represent a layer 3 interface with a dot here. Meanwhile, we are also going to have loopback interfaces on these edge devices, and we're going to use these loopback interfaces to form the VXLAN tunnels. But if we're going to use them to form the VXLAN tunnels, well, the underlay needs to know where those loopbacks are. So we need to make sure that when we deploy the underlay routing protocol, that we are advertising the loopback interfaces into the network. So moving on, what do we need to think about from a wireless perspective? Now, one thing we've learned about wireless and SDA is that when we deploy the wireless LAN controller, it's going to be off of the fabric. In other words, it's part of the underlay. We might have a fabric border node and the wireless LAN controller hangs off of that in some fashion. Maybe it's inside the data center, or maybe it's directly attached to the border node. Either way, it's not part of our fabric overlay. Well, because of that, we need to make sure that our access points, when they come online, are able to reach out to this wireless LAN controller to form the CAPWAP tunnel. And a default network is not going to cut it because we might have an external border node or a default border node that is also connected to the fabric, and a default route will carry that traffic to the external border node, not the internal border node, which is probably where our wireless LAN controller is connected. So we need to make sure that whatever network this wireless LAN controller is on is being injected into the fabric such that we have those routes available to us on the edge devices. Next, we need to think about MTU. From an MTU perspective, we recall that VXLAN requires either an extra 50 bytes or 54 bytes, depending on whether we're carrying a VLAN tag. Either way, Cisco's going to try to make this easy on us and say, hey, our MTU should really just be set to 9100. This is going to make sure that even if we're running jumbo frames at 9000 bytes, that we have plenty of overhead, 100 bytes of overhead, in order to handle the VXLAN headers as well as anything else that might arise. Cisco also wants to make sure that when we connect these edge devices, as we've drawn here a couple of times now, that these are point-to-point -point links. Now, in modern networks, especially if this is a Layer 3 environment, this is almost guaranteed to be point-to-point. -point. However, if it's Layer 2, or we have just something else going on here where we've got a switch in the middle, and we've got other devices hanging off of it, eh, that's not desired from an SDA fabric perspective. So let's make sure that these connections between our fabric edge nodes and the underlay devices are dedicated point-to-point -point links. And by the way, Cisco wants these connections to be a minimum of 10 gig of throughput. Next, it's time to talk about something really exciting, everyone's favorite topic, IGP timers. We know that we can tune IGP timers to improve convergence, meaning that when a link goes down, we rapidly convey that to the rest of the network to keep everything online. However, and this might sound odd, Cisco doesn't actually want us to do this in an SDA fabric. Instead, they want us to use bidirectional forwarding detection, or BFD. We can think of BFD as sort of an a la mode protocol. We can pair it up with a lot of different network protocols in order to improve failure detection. And the great part about BFD is it's low overhead. We don't need to rely on IGP hellos, which if we tune IGP timers, we have to deal with all of these hello messages coming in. And there's a lot of overhead involved with processing those hellos. Instead, BFD is going to send its own hellos, which require far less processing than IGPs, and therefore can be sent in very rapid fashion. 
Now also along the lines of rapid convergence, we need to consider protocols such as stateful switchover, SSO, and nonstop forwarding, or NSF. This is primarily going to be used in chassis switches, but also in any device that has multiple route processors. So we clearly have a lot of concepts here, but it does boil down to a few main ideas. First of all, we want to build our underlay on layer three and using ISIS as a routing protocol. Those are Cisco's recommendations. Unless we have an explicit reason why we can't do that for some reason, then that is absolutely the direction we should take. Now, we want to make sure that those layer three links are all point to point links. And we need to remember to increase the MTU to 9100 to deal with the VXLAN headers, but also anything else that might come up. Now, when it comes to fast convergence, we want to make sure that we are leveraging BFD for all of our IGP connections, but then also we want to turn on NSF and SSO on any devices in the network that require it. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.